All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks again to the organizers for the kind invitation. Uh, it's my first time here in Salt Lake City and at this conference, and it's uh, truly an honor to be here. Uh, so I'm Eric, and I recently opened up the lab at uh, the Earl Childs Research Institute at uh, Providence uh, Cancer Center. That's in Portland, and uh, I previously was at the National Institutes of Health, NIH, uh, where I worked with uh, Dr. Steve Rosenberg um, on a type of immunotherapy called adoptive T-cell therapy. And so today I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about adoptive T-cell therapy in the context of gastrointestinal cancers, um, such as cholangiocarcinoma. And I'd like to highlight um, a patient that we treated where uh, T-cell therapy appeared to be effective. Um, I'd also like to highlight some of the challenges we face as we try to develop more effective immunotherapies for patients with metastatic GI and cholangiocarcinomas. So the type of uh, immunotherapy, again, we work on is called adoptive T-cell therapy, uh, or ATT, uh, using tumor-infiltrating lymphocytes. And so the way it works is, um, okay. So a patient comes into our clinic. Uh, we excise a tumor, a metastatic lesion. We take that tumor back into the lab, and we mince it up into small fragments, usually about one to two millimeters in size. We put those tumor fragments into a tissue culture plate in the presence of high-dose interleukin-2. And interleukin-2 is a potent T-cell growth factor. Uh, so what happens over the course of several weeks is that uh, each one of these wells, uh, millions of T-cells are in these wells now. Um, when we can, we evaluate whether or not any of those T-cells recognize a tumor, if possible. If we find tumor reactivity, we select those uh, T-cell cultures or TIL cultures and then we use a protocol to expand uh, those T cells uh, from millions of T cells here to actually tens to even hundreds of billions of T cells. And then those T cells are reinfused into the patient um, that has been lymphodepleted. So we use a combination of fludarabine and cyclophosphamide to precondition the patient. And this actually appears to be very important for the efficacy of the T cells. And so the uh, concept of this is very simple, actually. So the idea behind this is that uh, there are T cells within the tumor, and at least some of these T cells are there because they're recognizing tumor. And so if we can uh, expand those tumor reactive T cells to a large army, uh, then potentially when we reinfuse back into the patient, then that may mediate tumor regression. And so in the setting of metastatic melanoma, which is the deadliest form of skin cancer, uh, this type of therapy can be curative. So what I'm showing you here is uh, three sequential trials of 93 patients uh, treated at the surgery branch, um, treated with uh, TIL plus high-dose interleukin-2. And so you can see that there are a subset of patients, 20 here, that achieve what we call a, a CR, complete response, where their uh, tumor uh, disappears. And except for one patient, they all are um, tumor-free. Um, there are a subset of patients that achieve a PR, partial response, uh, which means their tumor shrank, but unfortunately uh, they eventually grew back, and uh, some patients that had no response. Um, so we do have to do better, that's for sure. Uh, nonetheless, this is proof of principle that adopted T-cell therapy using TIL can cure some patients with metastatic solid cancers. Um, although melanoma is a uh, deadly disease, it's actually quite rare. And so we were actually um, interested in to test whether or not TIL therapy could be effective in other uh, types of cancers, such as metastatic GI cancers. Um, unfortunately, this type of therapy, the way I've described, is actually not very effective in the setting of metastatic GI cancers. So what I'm showing you here, um, 15 patients with various forms of GI cancers, colon cancers, cholangiocarcinomas, uh, gastric cancer, et cetera, where we used TIL therapy, as I've described, and virtually all these patients were progressive disease. Um, so we infused tens to hundreds of billions of T-cells, and the tumors just kept growing. Um, however, there was one patient here, highlighted here, with metastatic cholangiocarcinoma that um, had tumor shrinkage and stabilization of disease for about a year. And so we were um, wondering whether or not uh, the treatment that we gave her, the T-cells that we gave her, um, contributed to the response, and if so, what did they recognize? What were those T cells actually recognizing to mediate the response? Were they recognizing mutated antigens? And I'll refer to these as neoantigens. Neoantigens are just neo is new, antigen is something that elicits an immune response. 
And so uh, before I get too far ahead of myself, just a mutation is simply a, a change in the DNA sequence of, in the genome of a cell. And so that's, this is a characteristic or hallmark, hallmark of a cancer cell, is that its DNA is not quite the same as a normal cell because of mutations and other genetic alterations. And so again, this is a, you probably don't need to know this, but uh, DNA uh, gets uh, transcribed to RNA, and then RNA goes into protein, and protein is what uh, we, our bodies need to function. In a cancer cell, uh, mutation occurs in DNA. This is transcribed into the RNA. And then you have a, um, a protein that's quite different because it has a mutation at a specific location. And so why are we actually um, interested in mutations or neoantigens? Well, so remember the first graph that I showed you where in metastatic melanoma there were a subset of patients that achieved complete responses. So we had a, a group of researchers at the surgery branch that tried to ask the question, well, what is it about the T cells we gave those patients that correlated to their response? And I'm just showing you um, three citations here. These are three studies published by our group. And what they found was that in those patients that had complete durable responses or dramatic tumor regressions, when we looked at the infused, infused T cells, we could find T cells that recognized mutations or neoantigens expressed just by the patient's own cancer. So this is a, a correlation. Again, it doesn't mean that those cells uh, were the ones that mediated regression, but it's just a correlation. We found neoantigen reactive T cells in these infusion products, and these patients had really uh, durable clinical responses. And so back to the patient with a metastatic cholangiocarcinoma. So we asked the questions, are T cells targeting neoantigens uh, present in the infusion product of the patient with um, metastatic cholangiocarcinoma. So the way we actually evaluate whether or not T cells can recognize neoantigens is highlighted in this diagram here. So we start with a, a tumor. Uh, the tumor is actually um, RNA and DNA is isolated from the tumor. And then we perform a next generation sequencing, whole exo and RNA-seq analysis. And after some bioinformatics, we actually identify mutations expressed by the tumor. Uh, these tumors are, or these mutations are then encoded in something what we call the tandem minigene construct, or we actually make long peptides that um, have the mutation. And so the tandem minigene construct is shown here. And so what this is, is essentially um, a genetic construct that encodes for the mutation flanked by 12 nucleotides that include 12 amino acids of the wild type protein. And so the reason why we make a tandem mini gene construct is so instead of evaluating each mutation um, alone, it's actually quite cumbersome. We actually can link them together so that we can actually evaluate many mutations in one go. So it just makes our screening uh, procedure a lot more efficient. And so now we've got a genetic construct that encodes for a lot of mutations. We can introduce this into what we call an autologous APC, antigen presenting cell. We use dendritic cells. And so what happens is that this um, TNG, mutated TNG construct, processes and presents these mutations in the context of the patient's own MHC molecules. And these molecules are important for T cell recognition. On the other side of the coin, we have T cells. So again, as I've mentioned, we grow out TIL, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, individual fragment cultures, and then we test each one of these T cell cultures against um, this antigen presenting cell now expressing all the mutations. And so if we found reactivity, then that means the T cells are recognizing some mutation. Um, so we assess T cell activation using very standard immunological assays. Uh, interferon gamma is a cytokine um, protein that's expressed by activated T cells. Um, LE spot is just um, a technique we use in the lab. Um, and then we also do a flow cytometry analysis for T cell activation markers. So if, when a T cell sees an antigen, um, it will upregulate certain uh, receptors. And we evaluate these receptors called 41BB and OX40. So after a whole exome sequencing, we identified 26 mutations. Um, so a relatively low number of mutations in the lung metastases. And so we actually again, encoded all these mutations in tandem minigene construct as shown here, TMG1, 2, and 3. So TMG1 um, encodes for these mutations here, 
TMG2, these mutations, and TMG3, these mutations. And so again, we introduce it into autologous dendritic cells, and then we, we assess the T cells that we use for treatment. Uh, we co-culture. Co-culture is just bringing these two cell products together, and we evaluate whether or not these T cells um, are activated by any of these TMGs. So what I'm going to show you here is just an image of an LE spot assay. So an LE spot essentially um, evaluates uh, T cell production of uh, cytokines. So anytime you see a spot, um, that's essentially a single T cell that's made a cytokine, interferon gamma. It's been captured by the membrane. Um, that's similar to a Western blot. So when we do the co-culture, we take the infusion bag T cells and we co-culture with dendritic cells that express the TMGs. Uh, when we have a negative control, there's no spots. So the T cells don't react against this. But the T cells in the infusion product appear to recognize something in TMG1. You can see many spots here. Um, you don't see any reactivity against TMG2 or 3. And so this is just quantified here, T cell activation. So there's reactivity against TMG1. And so as you might remember, TMG1 is actually made up of many different mutations, which mutation is actually being recognized by the T cells. So the way we approach this is that we essentially took TMG1 and we made several separate um, genetic constructs. But these genetic constructs, we reverted each mutation back to the wild type sequence. And so we made, again, many constructs. And the idea behind this is that once we revert the mutation back to wild type, if there's a mutation reactive T cell, then it's actually going to lose reactivity once we revert it back to the wild type sequence. And so this is what we did. And you can see that we can see reactivity against all these other constructs. But when we revert uh, the mutation in ERB2IP, uh, you see we lose reactivity of the T cells. And so this demonstrates that the T cells in the infusion bag are recognizing a mutation in ERB2IP. And ERB2IP is just a um, negative regulator of um, ERB2, I, ERB2 signaling. So just a, a quick summary in as we move on. So this is the infusion product. Um, this is gated on CD4 positive T cells. This is a flow cytometry plot. On the y-axis, we have effector cytokines. And V-beta 22 is just a marker of the uh, potentially reactive T cell. And you can see when we stimulate the infusion product with wild type ERB2IP peptide, there's no re reactivity. But when you stimulate with the mutated ERB2IP peptide, you can see that these cells make a lot of IL-2, TNF, and also interferon gamma. Again, when we infuse this product, um, the patient experienced about a year of stabilization disease. Unfortunately, um, the lung tumors began to progress after about a year. So the infusion product ended up being about 25% um, of the infusion product was mutation reactive or neoantigen reactive against the ERB2IP mutation. Um, so she re received actually over 10 billion of these cells. So our hypothesis at this time was, well, if we gave her about 25% of neoantigen reactive T cells and about 10 billion, what happens if we gave her more of these cells and at a higher frequency or higher purity? So we actually generated a, a second infusion product shown here. And you can see that when you get on CD4 positive T cells, it's actually about 95% now are neoantigen reactive. And we were actually able to generate over 120 billion of these cells. And we infuse these cells. And you can see that the patient um, experienced a deeper and longer lasting tumor regression, strongly suggesting that if you can target a neoantigen or a mutation expressed by tumors, then you can potentially mediate tumor regression. Uh, this is what it looks like on a CT scan. So bulky disease, lung disease, prior to the second treatment. And you can see that they've. Um, regressed dramatically. So you might also notice that on that first graph that I showed you was that um, the cutoff was at January. And so some tumors actually completely disappeared, but there were some lung lesions that actually started to progress just um, late last year. And so we were asking the question, well, why did some tumors progress? And can we give her another effective treatment? And so the first thing that came through our mind, well, is, well, so we targeted one specific mutation, ERB2IP. And so one potential mechanism of escape for the tumor would be, well, maybe it doesn't even have the mutation anymore. 
maybe there's tumor clones that didn't have the mutation and escape. So we actually um, performed surgery again, um, and we took out four different lesions, and we uh, tested whether or not the mutation was still there. And this is um, standard uh, DNA Sanger sequencing. These are three different tumor nodules. This actually turned out not to be tumor. And you can see that this is a wild type sequence as A with uh, when there's no tumor observed. But you can see that this is a heterozygous here um, at these three uh, different lesions, um, suggesting that the mutation is actually still being expressed by the tumor. So loss of antigen, loss of the mutation is not, cannot explain why the lung disease is progressing. So then we next asked, well, are the T cells that we gave persisting in the patient? Are they still there? Are the neoantigen reactive T cells still in the patient? And so this is a very busy slide, but I'm just going to walk you through this. Um, this is T cell receptor deep sequencing. So this is a way we can track the cell that we gave because we know the exact T cell receptor sequence. Um, so what we have on the y-axis is the frequency of this T cell that we gave. And this is days relative to the first cell transfer. In the bars, we have the infusion bag, for example. So this is the infusion bag for the, the first treatment. About 25% were reactive against the rb 2 ip mutation. Um, in the red dots is the persistence in the blood. So when you look at um, this neoantigen reactive T cells, you can see that it's found in the blood at nearly 10% after 10 days of infusion, slowly dips down, and then her lung, her lung tumors were progressing at this point. So we actually resected three lesions, and you can see that the neoantigen reactive T cells are actually infiltrating these tumors, but the tumors are still progressing. This is a second treatment product shown here, about 95% pure in terms of neoantigen reactive T cells. And you can see that after infusion, um, the T cells actually persist long term. You can see three months, this is actually three months out, and nearly a third of her T cells um, are neoantigen reactive. And you can see that after several years, actually, um, the dominant uh, T cell clone in her blood is actually this mutation reactive T cells, neoantigen reactive T cells. It's about 3.4% of all her total T cells circulating in her blood. Um, so the one thing I do want to point out right now is that um, this observation right here. So this was a second um, resection where we gave, uh, where we took out three of her um, progressing lesions. And you can see that by sequencing, approximately 50% of all T cells in that tumor are reactive against the rb 2 ip neoantigen. So the T cells are clearly in the tumor. Uh, the mutation is clearly still being expressed by the tumor. Um, but yet these tumors are still progressing. So what's really, what's really going on? So then what we did was we looked at um, kind of the phenotype of the T cells that were infiltrating the tumors. And so what we did was we took the tumor, we digested the tumor, and then we had single uh, cell suspensions where we can analyze the T cells in there. And so again, the, the V-beta-22 is a marker of the reactive clonotype. Uh, this is a, one of the tumor lesions. These are two tumor lesions that we pooled together. This is peripheral blood cells. And so again, this is a marker of the neoantigen reactive T cell. So when you look at the neoantigen reactive T cells in the tumor, and you look at PD-1 expression, you can see that nearly all the cells, the neoantigen reactive T cells, are expressing high levels of PD-1. And this is more than the uh, V-beta-22 negative cells, which are potentially not reactive cells. And so as you're all familiar with, um, PD-1 is an immune checkpoint. And potentially, if it's being ligated on these cells or activated in these T cells, then it could be shut down. So this potentially could be a mechanism by which the tumor is uh, growing is by shutting down the T cells with the, within the environment. Um, so on the flip side of things, so there's PD-1, but there's also PD-L1. And so we evaluated whether or not in the tumor microenvironment there was PDL1 expression because if you have PD1 expression and nothing's really binding to it, theoretically it's probably not going to be activated and shutting down the T cells. Um, so we actually did immunohistochemistry, and you can see that you have the tumors, and you can see that when we look at PDL1 expression, there's actually high levels of PDL1 expression in the tumors. And this is just a higher magnification. Um, 
the thing that maybe it's hard to tell from this image is that the PDL1 expression is actually not expressed by the tumor cells. It's actually expressed by macrophages. Um, and so there's high infiltration of macrophages that express PDL1, and the T cells are expressing PD1. And so potentially there could be a shutdown mechanism at play through this pathway. So then we were thinking, well, given all these factors, right? So the fact that the mut mutation is still expressed, you have a high infiltration of neoantigen reactive T cells that are expressing PD1. Your tumor microenvironments are actually um, expressing PDL1. Then what can we actually do for this patient? So we actually decided to treat, uh, treat her with uh, pembrolizumab, anti PD1, and based on all the things I just mentioned. With the backup plan of, well, if the patient doesn't respond, then we could potentially come in with a combination of neoantigen reactive T cell therapy plus anti PD1. Um, but based on the fact that she'd already undergone two lymphodepletion, which is kind of harsh, uh, we decided to opt for this, um, this treatment, which is um, probably a little bit um, probably safer. And so I guess it's uh, encouraging that after six weeks, of pembrolizumab treatment. Um, the two measurable lung lesions are actually shrinking, you can see here. And I think I was talking to the patient. I think a lot of you actually know this patient. Um, so it's Melinda Bikini. Um, I think uh, she's our strongest champion and advocate, obviously. Um, and so her lung lesions are, again, regressing. And I believe I'll have to check um, with the surgery branch, but this one might be actually um, completely gone at this moment. So I'd uh, just like to conclude. Um, adoptive cell therapy with TIL can cure about 20 to 25 percent of patients with metastatic melanoma. However, this type of therapy is not, uh, not equally effective in metastatic GI cancers. Um, in a patient with a metastatic cholangiocarcinoma, the transfer of a highly pure population of CD4 positive T cells that recognized a neoantigen expressed uniquely by her own tumors um, was capable of meeting tumor regression that lasted about 35 months. However, there was some tumor regret, uh, progression, um, and at that point, those tumors expressed PDL. The tumor microenvironment expressed PDL1. The reactive cells expressed PD1. Treatment with anti PD1 is leading to uh, ongoing tumor regression. Um, so, one question you might have is well, how often can you find neoantigen reactive T cells in patients? And with patients with metastatic GI cancers, when we take out TIL, we do the sequencing, and we test whether or not those TIL recognize neoantigens. Uh, about 90% of the time, we'll find T cells that recognize unique uh, neoantigens expressed by the patient's own cancer. So that really um, suggests that this might be a target to go after. Um, but I do have to stress that it's still not good enough at this moment. Um, this last point, I, I, again, I do really want to stress. So, when we do this type of therapy, when we try to uh, test TIL for neoantigen reactivity and select the fragments, TIL cultures that recognize neoantigens, it's only been effective in about two out of 16 patients. And so those 14 other patients, um, we have hypothesis why they didn't respond. And um, so we have to do better. And I think on the next slide, uh, we're going to, I'll tell you about some of the ways where we think we can improve this therapy. So first, we're going to try to test whether or not we can enhance the therapy by combining with anti-PD-1. So for example, if the neoantigen reactive cells we're infusing are upregulating uh, PD-1 and getting inhibited, then potentially if we combine the therapy, then maybe we can make it more effective. Um, so one thing I didn't get into, but um, T cells are a lot like humans in the sense of age. So in preclinical mouse models, if you use a younger, less differentiated T cell, they're actually more effective than older differentiated T cells. And so many of the times um, when we use TIL, TIL are actually further along in the spectrum of age. And so these are older T cells. And so potentially if we can, um, for example, use younger T cells, it might be more effective. And so, but how do you use younger T cells? Um, one way is to actually isolate the T cell receptor. We can actually genetically isolate the T cell receptor and actually essentially transplant that into a younger T-cell population from the same patient, and that's called a TCR gene therapy. 
we can potentially combine it with other therapies. I know vaccines are actually um, making a, another comeback because because of the um, because it's so cheap now to sequence patients' tumors. Um, a lot of companies are now investing in whole exome sequencing of tumors and then generating personalized vaccines against neoantigens for those patients. So we can potentially combine that with T cell therapy. Um, I think the major hurdle though is here is targeting multiple neoantigens. So of those 16 patients that we treated, most of the patients actually received a cell product that targeted really just one neoantigen. And so a lot of you are also familiar with tumor heterogeneity. And so if you take a tumor out, you cut it up into eight different fragments. If you sequence each one of those fragments, you're going to find differences in the neoantigen profile, the mutation profile, and the expression profile of these antigens. So I think if you're targeting something like a driver mutation, which is expressed by most, most cancer cells or all cancer cells, um, that might work for you. And so the two responders, actually, we have one of them was against uh, KRAS, which is a driver mutation, and rb 2 ip is a putative driver as well. So um, potentially that's probably why Potentially, that's maybe a reason why that, uh, that, that therapy worked. But in the other patients, maybe those mutations were not driver mutations. Maybe they were lowly expressed. And so I think if you can broaden the response to tumor-specific antigens, that might be a way to improve the therapy. And like I mentioned, target driver mutations are possible. We're also trying to develop better assays to detect these neoantigen reactive T cells. And of course, um, in the patients that don't respond, hopefully we can get a better feeling in terms of um, why the patients did not respond. So study mechanisms of immune evasion and immune suppression. Uh, so with that, I'd just like to close. Um, again, so this work was done at the Surgery Ranch, NCI. A lot of people to thank there. Um, of course, uh, my mentor, Steve Rosenberg, who's uh, the pioneer of adopted T cell therapy, immunotherapy. And obviously the patients who have and are battling this disease, and um, I guess a special thank you to Melinda Bikini, who's been our greatest uh, champion um, advocate for uh, cancer research, phalangiocarcinoma research. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Like church on a Sunday morning.